Tonight, capacity limits are lifted for certain large venues. And they keep sucking us in the gut if we're an independent small business. It does, just doesn't seem fair. It may be good news for some sports and music fans, but there's strong reaction from small businesses plus. We cannot really solve the food insecurity problem with the food bank. On the second Thanksgiving weekend during the pandemic, more people are struggling to put food on the table and. Yeah, I guess you just go off adrenaline and survival mode. A family remembers the night their home was almost destroyed by fire. Their message to others this holiday weekend. This is CBC Saturday News. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Shannon Martin. For the first time in what feels like forever, capacity at sporting events and movie theaters is back to normal. But left out of the easing of COVID restrictions are restaurants, gyms, and other small businesses. Dale Manukduk has more on some of the confusion, frustration, and disappointment. Bygone Theatre hasn't performed a show in nearly two years, a production of The Rear Window in 2019. Only a full capacity would be worth it to start planning their next show. We set our budget based on ticket sales exclusively. So if we can only max out at a quarter at the most of the seats, then we can't possibly plan and take that risk. They say yesterday's announcement doesn't help many people at Bygone's level of theatre. More theatre in Toronto happens in smaller spaces, either in the round or site specific. Um, in venues like bars, so none of those things can actually open at capacity yet. Bars like the legendary Horseshoe Tavern, who still can't return to full standing capacity. It'll just be rows of uh, folding chairs. We, we couldn't get to 100%. Our capacity here legally is, uh, is 460, and by the time we put down chairs and make aisleways for fireways and exits, you're probably talking somewhere between about 195 and 210. That would be just 45% of their capacity, which is still 60 seats more than they currently have. Jeff Cohen questions why a sporting venue can pack 20,000 people into Scotiabank Arena. They keep making laws that work for big business, and they keep sucking us in the gut if we're an independent small business. It does, just doesn't seem fair. Cineplex couldn't be happier. Attendance has doubled this week at Varsity Cinema thanks to the capacity increase and the new James Bond movie. But the company is still proceeding with caution, especially for guests who bought tickets in advance. So at the time, the guests who have purchased their tickets, uh, they have exactly the same seats. And if they had purchased uh, a seat with the social distancing, that social distancing still stays in space. The new rules also have health professionals confused. You know, large sporting events, cinemas, they're, they're reasonable. Um, you know, it is still a little bit perplexing at why this wasn't extended out to things like gyms and restaurants. The province says that is because they are higher risk settings with prolonged close contact and enclosed spaces where face coverings are removed for the entire duration when seated. But that could also be the case at a sporting event. I think all of us that have seen the Blue Jays game, you know, have, uh, have uh, realized that the mask isn't always on in those venues. The Chief Medical Officer of Health will continue to monitor the data and evaluate when it may be safe to consider lifting limits in other settings that require proof of vaccination. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. This Thanksgiving, the need for food and donations is perhaps greater than ever. The Daily Bread Food Bank says it continues to see a consistent increase of client visits, now the highest ever recorded in the city's history. Lorenda Redekop has more on their critical campaign this weekend. It's a drive through food drop in Toronto. Food prices have jumped by more than double the rise in inflation. And the country's largest food bank organization says this will be its busiest year ever. We know that the average food bank user has about $9 a day to, uh, to, to live off of after paying for rent. So then you, you, you just make those small inflationary changes and, uh, and they are already underwater, and the situation is, is even more dire. In Ottawa, the Prime Minister packed gift baskets for families newly arrived from Afghanistan. The Governor General handed out food donations. But some agencies are looking at better ways to address food insecurity in this country. 
Global Medic is better known for responding to international disasters. It's now supporting food banks across Canada, buying millions of pounds of food in bulk. We're able to produce a package of green peas for 51 cents. That same package of green peas, a food bank could not buy for less than $2.19 in the store. If that same food bank were to buy a truckload of green peas, it would get down to about $1.70. So we're still less than a third the cost, and there's no food bank in the country that can take a truckload of green peas. It means the money food banks do have can go further. Anybody who works in the food bank world, we all know that it's a band-aid. Suman Roy runs food banks, a meals program, and also this community garden. It's absolutely incredible that you can just pick this fresh produce. Because, I mean, like a thing of cherry tomatoes at the grocery store costs like five bucks. You know, it gives you some sort of like humanity, right? You know, we're not, we're not all rolled up and people are just like, here you go. They also hold community events, learning together about growing food and cooking. When the kids are coming and growing the food, then they can come and actually make a casserole or make a pizza. A small project that's part of a much larger vision to increase food security. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. Selling local beer and wine in corner stores across the province. That idea has some big support, but others question whether the timing is right. I think it would help in uh, small businesses aspect in terms of convenience stores, but it also depends on what time you sell it and where you sell it and how the licensing is going to go as well. It just needs to be managed. I don't think there's any cons to it, and I think it's time we shifted away from things like the LCBO and the wine rack. It's ridiculous to me that there's only two places where we can do that. Whenever alcohol is easier to get, people are going to be concerned, but I guess, again, you have to weigh it against helping local businesses out as much as you can. It is something that's long been promised by the Ford government, part of an overall move towards easing rules around alcohol. But there are challenges, breaking Ontario's current agreement with the beer store and expanding liquor sales could mean taxpayers end up paying penalties. The Convenience Industry Council of Canada president says it's worth it. She says the change could bring a much needed boost to beer and wine producers after two tough years. This is about helping these businesses achieve the kind of economies of scale and have at their disposal 8,500 8, additional retail outlets, which we know from talking to them is something that they would really uh, like to have because they know that that will help grow their business. Meanwhile, the president of the Ontario Restaurant Hotel and Motel Association says the timing is not right, and this could hurt the hard-hit industry and slow recovery. By allowing the delivery of beverage alcohol with food during this pandemic and has been one of the few successes and a life-saving for many. Expanding the availability of alcohol will totally diminish this success. The province says it's currently reviewing its alcohol rules. It also passed legislation to end the beer store agreement, but that isn't yet in force. <laughs> Today, the province is reporting just over 650 new COVID-19 cases. Of the new case count, 464 have presented in people who are either not fully vaccinated or whose status is unknown. Nearly 87% of eligible Ontarians now have at least one shot. The city is hosting Vaxgiving this weekend, promoting clinics at TTC stations, malls, schools and libraries. Today, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health hosted its first COVID-19 vaccine clinic specifically for black staff, parents, friends and family. It's part of an effort to tackle vaccine hesitancy among the black community. There are several black staff. They have still have questions about the vaccine. They haven't been vaccinated yet. And they were wondering if they could have an opportunity to talk to others, people that look like them. So we were identified as a group that was least likely to uh, trust or want the vaccine. So, so again, that's the role we play. We answer questions, we treat people with dignity, uh, we respect their choice. But if they uh, want the vaccine, then we're happy to administer it. Um, and if they don't, we still respect their choice. This was one of three clinics. More are planned for Wednesday and Friday. Aww. 
Sophia Cambalia is here now with the forecast and kind of a rainy start to the long weekend. Yeah, but the rest of Thanksgiving weekend will likely be the kind of weather that you're very thankful for. We're talking even the potential for some record-breaking warmth, Shannon. Right now, we're sitting just under 20 degrees, a little bit of cloud cover. Uh, a few bands of rain could still come through into the evening and into the overnight period, but it will be very patchy at best. Most of the rain has already fallen this weekend, and that is the good news. For your overnight temperature, you will be warmer than what your daytime high should normally be this time of year. You'll be thankful for all that rain. It'll actually open up a southern flow and bring in a lot of warmth. A little bit of fog for Sunday morning. By Sunday afternoon, that long-awaited sunshine finally comes back. It's been a few days of gray, cloudy skies. You'll be 20 by Sunday afternoon. Those peaks of sun and then by Monday, plenty of sun potentially and a balmy 23. So good news for the Argos and the Raptors that'll be playing on Monday and uh, good news for the Leafs tonight. Now, if you average out the three days of Thanksgiving weekend, there's only been two Thanksgiving weekends in the past 15, 20 years where we've actually been averaged consecutively above 20 degrees. We have a chance to beat that for everybody this coming weekend. It's been 20 years for places like Sault Ste. Marie and Ottawa where they've been above 20 consecutively for Thanksgiving weekend. So it could be the warmest Thanksgiving weekend in over 20 years for many communities, Shannon. Wow, so take the turkey outside. Yeah, you can, have, uh, you can have the drinks on the deck this weekend. <laughs> there you go. Thanks so much. We'll see you a little later. You're welcome. See you soon. It is Fire Safety Week, and a Brampton family are remembering perhaps the most terrifying night of their lives. Their home caught fire, and they had to move quickly to get everyone out, including two relatives in wheelchairs. Here's their story and their message to everyone this long weekend. The whole garage was on fire. When we came over here to look, all we could see was fire about 100 feet in the air. I woke up to my mom yelling um, from upstairs. All I heard her say was somebody call 911 in a bit of a panic. Um, by the time I got to the top of the stairs, uh, my boyfriend was already up there and he was yelling, you know, there's flames coming from the garage. Everybody needs to get out. So it was a bit of a struggle getting a wheelchair and people, someone with one leg and then my elderly mother in a wheelchair as well. So it was a struggle, but my kids were able to uh, get them out safely. Make sure you have working smoke alarms, working carbon monoxide alarms in your home, but also a home escape plan. What to do if a fire does happen? Where do you meet? Because I know when our firefighters respond and they pull up at the front of the house, if we see everybody gathered in a meeting point, let's say on the, on the front boulevard by a tree, it makes our job a whole lot easier. This is where we kind of stayed right here until we figured we thought we'd be okay here because the firemen are here now. I could hear the trucks out in the front cars were blowing up and shingles were flying off the roof I guess from the cars blowing and a lot of smoke was coming to the backyard so they wanted us out. The firefighters and police just came immediately from every every fence like here they were jumping over from everywhere they tore down the fence back there completely. I had no shoes and I was walking over stone between those houses over there I was walking between the stones some neighbor i don't even know who it was just took his shoes off and said here take my shoes once we got out there with everybody neighbors were running into their house and grabbing blankets i guess you just go off adrenaline i didn't freeze you just do what had to be done and i just started yelling direction to everybody what to do i wouldn't leave the property until the firefighters finally brought out my last cat so i stayed 5 30 in the morning they brought the cat out and then i was content to leave I mean, we were fortunate, nobody was injured. Our alarms went off when they were supposed to go off, but I know that's not always the case. Just have a plan, talk about it. The academic community will gather virtually tomorrow to honor the life of Charles Mills. He graduated from the University of Toronto in the mid 80s before becoming a leading philosopher on race and racism. Delia Ashry has more on the legacy he leaves behind. The Racial Contract, which uh, uh, was published in 1997, it was a bombshell. Charles W. Mills, the author of five other books, was known as a philosopher of race and liberalism. He died over two weeks ago from cancer. The scholar attended graduate school at the University of Toronto in the late 70s. Frank Cunningham was a longtime friend of Mills, but also one of his teachers at grad school. He says Mills is one of the first ever black students to graduate from the philosophy department in the 80s. I taught the first course on race, philosophy and racism at the University of Toronto 
but it's only now that they're beginning to introduce uh, more such courses. So uh, this is, was and is a slow process, and Charles was really influential. The Jamaican philosopher was born in London, UK. Cunningham says Mills is one of the pioneers of critical race theory and an activist. He was active not just in anti-racism uh, matters, but he was also active with the, in the student movement. He was one of the organizers, for example, it was groundbreaking and hard fought of uh, the union for the unionization of teaching assistants. Pablo Idoso is a friend and was a fellow grad student with Mills in the 80s. He brought something to philosophy that previously had not been had not been brought, and that was uh, a critical racial lens. His scholarly influence extended beyond the borders. He taught at several universities in the States. Linda Martine Alkoff is not only his fellow colleague. Yeah, my husband says that I was Charles's work wife because I would take him clothes shopping and I would take him furniture shopping. And, you know, we, we were just like family. Known for his good sense of humor and also for his humbleness, Alkoff says Mills left a lasting impact on anyone interested in social theory and social change. Especially in relationship to race, racism and colonialism and class and capitalism and so he, he really wanted to support everybody, you know, who was, who was a young person interested in those areas. He didn't care about his class, his class's um, uh, peculiarity and penchant or difference on the basis of skin color and, and economic privilege. For him, it, it was the quality of your character as a human being that mattered, and he practiced that. Two separate virtual memorials will be held tomorrow. Charles Mills was 70 years old. Dahlia Ashri, CBC News, Toronto. That volcano on Spain's La Palma Island continues causing destruction. At least four buildings were engulfed as rivers of lava poured down the mountainside. 37 seismic movements were registered today alone. The eruption started September 19th. Since then, more than 1,100 buildings have been destroyed, almost 500 hectares of land has been swamped, and 6,000 people have been forced from their homes. Well, it is a world premiere like unlike any other, Beethoven's never-before-heard Symphony No. 10. It's never been heard because it was never written, at least not by Beethoven himself. But with the help of AI, music scientists and composers, it's now being released 194 years after his death. Yelena Adzik has more. Do you think it's possible for a computer to generate a symphony that comes close to what Ludwig van Beethoven would have composed? Well, let's get ourselves in the mood, shall we? Here's a famous piece he did compose. <laughs> Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is just one of the classics input into a computer as part of a new project that aimed to finish the Tenth Symphony Beethoven himself never completed before his death in 1827. Artificial intelligence software was not only fed the entire body of his work, but it was also provided with works from composers who influenced Beethoven during his lifetime, including Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, together with music experts, scientists, and historians, here's a listen to what the algorithm conceived to be Beethoven's 10th symphony. What is not so clear is how the AI took into consideration the way Beethoven's music changed because of the fact that he became deaf by the age of 44. That's something that is very powerfully covered in the 1994 movie Immortal Beloved with Gary Oldman as the legendary composer. I think he's going mad. He bellows this stupid childish tune at the top of his lungs. Now another part of the lore around Beethoven is the so-called Curse of the Ninth, which gained traction because Beethoven, Mahler and Dvorak, among other composers, all died after writing their Ninth Symphonies. So it remains to be seen if the computer will feel a little nervous about its fate after the release of today's 10th symphony. I'll leave you with a little more. Yelena Adzik, CBC News, Toronto.
That's the perfect entrance song for your full forecast, wouldn't you say? What do you think? Music to the ears. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's a tough act to follow when you're talking about Beethoven's 10th, though. Maybe a balmy Thanksgiving weekend will yeah. be uh, <laughs> a little bit on par. What do you think? I think so, and I think Monday's the day to go to the pumpkin, pumpkin patch, right? With I, the kids, I should book the time slot now. Yeah. It uh, could be the day to have the Thanksgiving cooked on the barbecue as well, if you like that kind of thing. Most of the rain has already fallen this weekend. It was a dreary last few days, a lot of cloud cover the past little while, but the good news is oncoming. Meanwhile, in Western Canada, one of the coldest Thanksgivings in years, with snow in some forecasts. Uh, meanwhile, for us, there will be some areas in Northern Ontario that will be warmer than the Baja Peninsula of Mexico, for example. It's this big ridge of high pressure that will be pummeling the warmth in from the deep, deep south. Look at this long range forecast, a stretch of 20 degrees days as far as the eye can see the feels like in the high 20s for many days it's common in October as you know to have mittens and shorts on in the same day but to have a prolonged stretch of warmth like this is certainly a little bit uncommon and it continues for a while in fact we are uh, entering potential record-breaking territory there's only been four stretches of more than seven days of 20 degree consecutive days in history we have a chance of taking a run at 11 day stretch that was set in 19 1947, not only in Toronto, but in a few communities as well, including Windsor, which has a forecast of 11 potential days over 20 degrees. And if we can crack a little bit of extra hours of sunshine as well, it will be the icing on the cake. There is your forecast for Thanksgiving Monday. We'll keep breaking it down for you tomorrow as well when I'm back with you. But 20 degrees really across the board, all the way from Windsor up to Timmins, Shannon. And 30, is that right? Did I just see that on the Windsor map? Feels like Feels 30. Feels like 30. Yeah. That is crazy. We'll take it in yeah. October. No worries. Thanks so much. We hope you have a great night, everybody. We're so glad you could join us tonight. You can stay caught up on news anytime on cbcnews.ca.